All right, welcome everyone. We just lost Frederick. <laughs> he'll uh, he'll join back. I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, he's uh, yeah he's still there. So um, welcome everyone to that podcast today. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying that nice weather that we have outside, even if you're from elsewhere, from Montreal or Quebec. I hear that it's pretty nice over there too. Um, so before starting the podcast, uh, this uh, podcast this week, we have a special guest. Uh, he's hiding right now. And no, it's not the skeleton behind GN. It's uh, uh, Frederick Nalai, who's a warrant officer. There you go. There you go. Um, so he's a warrant officer in Montreal. Um, uh, and he's also a triathlete, a level Ironman, full Ironman. So the podcast today will be kind of like a little bit special just because you guys can interact at any time. If you do have any questions, feel free to just put in the, in the comments in the chat at any time. It doesn't, uh, for us, it won't matter anything. Um, we will answer the questions, uh, along the podcast. It could be like right away. If we know that we're not talking, we're not going to talk about it or, uh, it's going to be in the podcast. We will not forget you. Um, and also we will accept people who wants to join a uh, video while, uh, wise here with us on the podcast. We can only have another uh, person on video. So if you want to join with your video, your webcam, and you want to ask a question directly to Gian, to Frederick, or even myself, uh, you can just mention it in the chat. Just be like, uh, just accept me as a video and we will accept you and you can ask a question directly to us. So enough said, let's start that podcast. So welcome, Gian. Welcome, Frederick. How's it going? Good. Thanks. Thanks. How are you? Uh, I'm good too. Um, just before the podcast, me and Frederic, we were chatting again about bicycle and stuff. So might as well start the podcast now because I think we, we will never stop talking about this kind of stuff. Like we can see already that Frederic has a lot of passion into Iron Man and that level. Like he loves to talk about it. So let's start recording this already. Um, now, for you guys who don't really know uh, Iron Man, Iron Man level, um, don't don't go on Wikipedia because uh, I did and I wrote some stuff. And guess who corrected me? <laughs> Frederic corrected me. He's like, mm -mm, no, that's not it. So according to the updates of uh, a person who really know what is an Iron Man, here it goes. So actually, an Iron Man, it's three sports in one. It's a triathlon, so you're going to uh, swim, you're going to bike, and you're going to run. But it's uh, the distance are boosted, are really like longer than normal triathlons. So you have levels of triathlons, you have sprints, you have Olympics, you have, um, after that, another one. Um, I don't remember. Half the other Ironman. One. Oh, I thought I had another one before Half Ironman. But you have Half Ironman, and then you have the Ironman. So basically, the Ironman level is 3.86 kilometers of swimming, so 2.4 miles, they work in miles. You do right after that 180.25 kilometers of bike, which is 112 miles of distance, and you finish with a marathon, so 42.2K, which is 26.22 mile. Um, that's why you're gonna you're gonna see on uh, Ironman's a number right besides it. Uh, if you see a 70 point uh, two, is it point two or point three? Point three. Point three. That is the total distance that you have to to do in your Ironman. And if you do a full Ironman, it's the double distance. So it's 140.6. So that's a lot. Like just a marathon for myself. That's a really big challenge. But no, that's not enough for Frederick. Um, he needs to do also 180K and a 4K of swimming. Um, in uh, Canada, now actually to compete at the uh, world level or the Ironman World Championship, that, that is held in Hawaii, uh, but that is for the full Ironman. This is where Fe Frederick corrected me. Um, you, can, uh, you have to finish in the top three of your gender in your group of age. And uh, the half Iron Man always change places from year to year. So this year was supposed to be in New Zealand, if I'm correct. Correct. Yeah. 
But with the COVID, actually, it's kind of like hard to have that kind of competition. So we'll see where is the um, other competition will be. But uh, just to give you an idea of how long this kind of uh, competition or um, or taking um, just to complete uh, like the world record of an Ironman was um, done by Jan Frodino. He's a uh, German and his total time was seven hours, 51 minutes and 13 seconds. Seven hours. That's like a day of work. Just to s tell you guys um, the distance and the woman uh, who held the, the world record She's from Switzerland, and it's Daniela Riff, and she did it in 8 hours, 26 minutes, and 18 seconds. So these are the world records. They're not even like the average time, the average time of a person who does a full Ironman, so which is longer. So it's pretty impressive, which I want to start with a first question that I'm going to put in the polls. I want you guys to try to answer that, and we'll get, there you go. That will be the first question. I want to see if you guys did um, try a triathlon in, in the past. If it was a triathlon, what was the um, the distance? A sprint, an Olympic, half Ironman, Ironman, or you never did. If you never did, you could also put in the chat if you want to try that because that's probably the reason why you're here today. So, um, yeah, in Canada, also Frederick corrected me on that. There's not two competition, but there's three. Three places that you can do the Ironman. Um, the first one is in Mont Tremblant. We'll get back to that. The second one is in uh, Penticton in British Columbia. And the third one is in Whistler. So you can do the Whistler must be really nice to do. It's just beautiful over there. Like I just enjoy every time I'm over there. I'm like, I don't want to come back. But uh, yeah, it, it must be really nice to, to do that Ironman over there. Um, yeah, so today our uh, special guest, Philippe Nolin, he did uh, a bunch of Ironmans and half Ironman. He did start in um, a couple years in 2014, um, but as today, he is the he has reached the top one percent in the world, finishing 227th position. This is out of 27,000 people. So 27,392, he's the number 20, 227. So just to let you know, guys, this is pretty impressive. And he also, he is in number six position in Canada out of 843 athletes. So just to consider yourself as an Ironman athlete, that's a big thumbs up. And uh, he's the number sixth in Canada. And uh, that will give him, obviously, the all-world athletes, uh, gold statue. So congrats, Frédéric, for that. And Thanks. welcome with us today. Um, but also, what's really special with Frédéric, he's a military. Uh, he's a warrant officer right now in saint jean sur richelieu in Quebec. So obviously, he's bilingual. And um, he has how many years in the military so far? 21. Oh, my God. That's a... Uh, that don't... don't that's not going to put us like really young, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but that's pretty impressive though um and also um yeah that's pretty much what he's doing right now he's an air force guy was in the, the army before um but now he's air force now enough me talking i want to start with a question to frederick when did you want to start competing in that sport and what was your trigger that made you start in this sport so, uh, long story short, uh, back in 2014, uh, uh, I'll admit it, I was totally out of shape. Uh, when we talked about sports, it was fishing and hunting. That was it. And actually, it was during uh, turkey hunting season. Uh, I got on the scale and I'm like, oh my God, I need to do something. Um, I, I got back into shape as soon as uh, turkey uh, hunting stopped. I never uh, hunted again or pretty much uh, next to none. Uh, I uh, got focused on the sport. I uh, got a bike, started biking to work. Uh, instead of uh, doing nothing during my lunchtime, I would get back on my bike and cycle even more. And then a friend of mine, uh, Eric Thibault, used to be a military as well. He's like, uh, hey, Fred, why don't you go and grab a, a road bike from the PSP gym uh, and, and come and ride with us? So uh, so I did, and I didn't even know how to shift a road bike. I didn't even know how it worked. 
So uh, the first time I actually got on the road bike, I got stuck in the big gear and I had to, to make it all the way the, all the way home and uh, I didn't even know how to shift properly and uh, I knew how to brake obviously but like uh, I was coming from far uh, and I cycled cycled and uh, every lunchtime I would cycle with the, with a small group and I was really like the slowest the slowest in the group um, in biking when, when you actually uh, follow each other the first person up front uh, can, can break the wind for you and it's much easier for the the, the next uh, people in behind you and uh, I would never break when I was never strong enough for that. And uh, they, they would actually come and get me and push me, physically push me in, in my back to, 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 to help me catch up the other ones in the small hills and stuff. And uh, next thing you know, they, they were triathletes, so they, they would also uh, swim a, a, and run uh, while I would perform myself or perform again on the on the bike path that, that we kept doing over and over. And I, I tried to beat my own time. I, Listen, I had my old GPS hunting GPS taped on my handlebar. I mean, really, it was uh, it, it was something, and um, and and that's it. I mean, I, I just kept cycling and cycling and start dropping weight, and it, it was just encouraging. And uh, PSP also has a uh, a program. It's called the Aerobic Fitness uh, Seal. I'm not sure if you're aware of that program. So it's like a fitness award. So that got me motiv motivated as well. So I started collecting uh, points for that. Uh, so that's another topic. We can we, we can talk about it another time, I guess. But uh, that got me really motivated as well to, to collect some points. And um, and then one, one, my wife looked at me and she's like, hey, you're, you're getting back into shape. You're dropping weight. Like, I want in on this. So So she wanted to start running. Uh, she, she really, she wasn't a big cyclist then, so she just wanted to start running. So what we did, we registered for a, sh a, a very short run. It was a 5k, uh, the, the color run, like the, the run or die where you throw the powder and everything, like every, you end up like full of chalk and stuff. So it was so something really silly, but you know, you just had to have a goal and uh, work to work towards it. So, uh, we started running and then, uh. Uh, uh, being in the military, we all run. So I just did what I what I did, and uh, just ran with my wife. Gave her tricks, and uh, then a friend of mine, uh, Pat Simono, Patrick Simono, still military. He's actually posted the BC this year. Lucky guy. Yeah, um, lucky guy. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> he, he's the one that challenged me to triathlon. So uh, I got I started triathlon. I started getting back in <coughs> June 2014. And now we're in uh, August, and uh, Pat looks at me and says, uh, "Hey, Fred, uh, you're biking and you're you're sw you're uh, sorry, you're biking and you're running." He's like, uh, "How's your swimming?" I said, "Well, I used to swim when I was in high school back as a kid, you know, early early age of high school." But uh, I said, "Yeah, I can swim." He's like, "You want to do a triathlon?" And I'm like, "What the heck is a triathlon?" And he's like, "You swim and then you bike and then you run." And I'm like, "Yeah, sure." And I remember registering for that race. It was a, uh, it was about seventy-five bucks. I'm like, who would be crazy enough to spend seventy-five dollars to go <laughs> and suffer for, for like an hour or something? Now I'm paying over a thousand bucks for for a race, you know. But back in the days, I thought it was the silliest thing ever. But I, I did it anyway. I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm gonna do it. And we're not and, even uh, talking about the bike behind you. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's not talk about that yet. <laughs> But uh, so uh, long story short, um, the triathlon was uh, two weeks later and I uh, haven't hit the pool. So they hooked me up with a swimmer, an old chief, crusty chief, one officer, MP, uh, that uh, uh, really uh, showed me. He saved my life in the water. Uh, he, he's like, are you serious? You got so he watched me swim and he's like, oh, my God, are you serious? You're really going to do a triathlon? So he gave me some tricks, and uh, two weeks uh, two weeks later, just before the, the triathlon, he looks at me and says, well, I think you're going to survive. Good luck. And, <laughs> and, and those were his words. And uh, I went and did the triathlon. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, it was extremely windy in Wasaga Beach. And we had about uh, two to three foot waves. So it was really wavy. So they, uh, for, for, because normally it's a really calm water, uh, they decided to cancel the swim. So I was a bit frustrated because I really wanted to do this. You know, uh, I signed up for a, a triathlon, not a duathlon. A duathlon is the, uh, is, is the swim portion is taken off. So, but they, they changed it to a duathlon. And, uh, 
So we had to run uh, two point, sorry, we had to run five kilometers. Um, then we had to bike 20 kilometers, then run 2.5. So we had to run twice. And uh, the, uh, the horn started, the race started, we got there, the race started and uh, 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 a switch in my head went off. I gave it all I had. Um, and I, I just destroyed the competition. I, I, I did extremely well. I did not perform, uh, I, I performed so well, so much more than I expected. I, uh, I ran pretty much the same, uh, same speed as my friend Pat, uh, and, but I got about five minutes on him on the bike. So I ended up uh, finishing ahead of him and he was training for triathlon for, for a long time. So uh, after the race, he was a bit, uh, let's say, jealous of my performance. He's like, man, where did this come from? You know, it's like, I would be I too. Know, it's, ti it's time to race. So let's go. <clears throat> so uh, and then he, we're laughing about this and then uh, he's... Uh, he brings me to, uh, you know, the big board at the end of a, a race. There's uh, boards with the sheets uh, stapled on the wall where they show your times and everything. And he's like, let's go see our stats. And I'm like, yeah, sure. So we go see our stats. And he looks at me. He's like, man, you got a podium. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I uh, first first race, I got a, a third place podium for my age group. So I couldn't believe it. So I'm like, all right, let's stick around for this. So I got up uh, on the podium, got my medal. And he's like, Fred, you really need to, to, to do another one. You need to qualify for military nationals. You're good. You know, you got, you, you, you're good. You got this. So we look at our schedule and it was coming to the end of the year. And uh, with the next weekend, we had another race coming up. Uh, it was two and a half hours away from Morden. So we got up at three in the morning. Uh, we got in this truck. We, we went down there and then uh, the water was calm, but it was cold as hell. It was, I think it was like something like around uh, eight degrees outside and the uh, water temperature was so cold as well so uh, uh, i went and bought a wetsuit to survive because uh, I, I really I, i'm pretty sure i would be uh i would have got hypothermia if it wasn't for uh for the, that the wetsuit. wetsuit so oh yeah uh end of season i was really really lucky uh half like 50 percent off so still 300 dollars for a, a wetsuit uh, and that's 50 percent off so for me back in the days i'm like what am i doing so <laughs> so like I'm like 300 bucks. That's like a rifle for hunting, you know, like, so, so my mindset is not in the, in the triathlon yet, but I'm like, what the heck I'm doing this. So I bought the wetsuit and, uh, same thing. I, I destroyed the competition. I finished second place in my age group, uh, eight seconds behind the first guy. So, uh, in my age group, so I did really, really well. And, uh, I mean, when you have a, a, a great start of a season, like, like of an opportunity of a, a, a sports like this, you you get hooked like it's uh, as simple as that as you get hooked yeah but, you uh, see you have a lot of potential so you're like oh might right? as well like and i'm just that starting much. and i'm still dropping weight at that time i mean uh, right now i'm 65 pounds lighter than what i used to be so it's a big big change wow oh yeah so, uh, yeah so uh, the first year i really did uh, those two triathlon and then i'm like all right let's focus on uh, on triathlon training and i i started it and uh but i remember keeping going uh thinking that sprint was way too short for me. But by the time I got where I just started to break a sweat and it was over. So the next year we uh, registered as an Olympic distance, which is double the distance for, for, um, for a sprint. So uh, Olympic is a 1.5 kilometer uh, swim, a 40K bike and then 10K run. And uh, once again, after that, that Olympic, I'm like, I'm not done. I, like I'm just, I'm good. I'm just getting started. So that's where I really found out that I was a long distance kind of guy. Uh, same thing for my uh, my runs. Uh, the, the fact that I run 5k or 21k, uh, it's the same pace. So might as well go the long run. So I figured. Uh, I, I really noticed really fast that I was a long distance kind of person. Wow, that's good. So Frederick, what's the process to qualify for the World Championships? So. Uh, for the for so every uh, so we're talking Ironman here. Ironman is just uh, like the brand. So this uh, world championship for Ironman is in Hawaii for uh, for the Ironman distance. And then, uh, like Francis said earlier, uh, for a half Ironman, it depends. It varies from place to place. But the process is similar. So long story short, depending how, on how many people is in your group, so the uh, older or very young age group, you'll see maybe one or two spots per uh, age group category, but uh, the ones that are more popular like mine, normally there's uh, three spots uh, available. 
So uh, you need to pretty much finish uh, in the top three for your age group. So you need a podium to, to qualify for the World Championship. Uh, if you're lucky enough, uh, number one or number two or, uh, might not be able or already qualified for a spot. So then uh, it's going to have what we call the roll down. So now it's going to go to the fourth and the fifth position. So uh, I've seen it uh, roll down for, for the, uh, the Ironman itself. I've seen it roll down to the fifth or sixth position myself, but nothing more than that. Uh, so I'm always hovering around, normally around the eighth, ninth position. So I'm always uh, hoping, uh, but, uh, but yeah, my, my turn will come. My turn will come eventually. Oh, you will go to Hawaii for sure. Okay. <clears throat> Um, how's like, what is your typical training? Like, how does it look like? And yeah, how can you get yourself ready for that kind of, uh, Ironman stuff? So Ironman, we're talking like a, a race that can last the, the average person, like, yeah, we got the records, but uh, the average person will finish, uh, the pros will finish in, uh, eight, between eight, and nine hours, but the average person will, will start finishing around the nine, nine thirty all the way up to 17 hours so it's a really long race it's a really long day so um we, we really need to talk about volume when we're talking about training with these kind of with, with an iron man um when we talk about like a sprint distance we're talking high intensity low volume so when you're actually training you're actually pushing your limit to the the speed if you want uh compared to a uh, an Ironman like uh, my this weekend, I'm I'm most likely gonna bike a, a four-hour bike ride uh, in my basement. So just uh, for volume, but no speed. But it's all about the time in the saddle. So it's a uh, uh, tons of volume. I remember one time that uh, we had a chat and you were doing a uh, 150k on your bike inside. That was pretty impressive. And we had yeah, a meeting yeah. like. He was yeah, having a meal uh, while doing bike. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's impressive. How do you train during the winter? Uh, I'm all set up downstairs. So I have a treadmill. Uh, ideally, because uh, you run a bit, I find you run uh, differently on a treadmill than outside. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to risk slipping and, uh, and hurting myself. So whenever it's icy outside, I, I'll run on the treadmill. But whenever, uh, even if it's cold, it's fine. I'm uh, well equipped uh, to go and run outside. And I'll, I'll go and run outside. Um, as for the, um, uh, the bike, you can put a trainer and, and bike downstairs or, uh, or, well, or indoors, I mean, but, uh, for me, I got a spin bike. So the similar ones that you guys, that most PSP uh, gyms, uh, have them, the Kaiser bikes. So, uh, mine's actually Bluetooth and I can, I can connect online and, uh, there's applications out there. Um, I, I personally use uh, Zwift. So then you can uh, connect with uh, fellow uh, triathletes. After this uh, podcast, I actually have a race with someone in Dagetown, uh, another military member. So it's pretty sweet. Uh, it gets you guys, get us connected, right? So we can actually uh, compete against <coughs> each other and have some fun too. So, How do you call that program? Like how does it call uh, it? Zwift. Rift. Oh. Zwift. Is that W-I-F-T? Okay. Yeah, Zwift. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's obviously not that free, but uh, you can like compete with other people. That's pretty nice. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's a that's a really cool thing because like uh, right now, what I do with my bike, it's I just like start a Netflix program and I just do my bike while watching a Netflix thing. But I think it would be even better if you like compete with other people while you're doing it. It gets, gets you pushing. Oh yeah, pretty much. Are you gonna have a partner who's somewhere, probably in BC, and competing against you? And you have to pedal. Let's go. Right. Do it. Right. Do it faster. But that's a lot of training. Like uh, as you mentioned, like twelve to twenty hours per week. Um, so how do you manage that with your work and also your family? Um, how do you kind of like set that in your schedule while keeping your family intact and no having issues, and also your work and not like have, arriving late at work how do you manage that so uh well lately it's been uh it's been uh good uh with the weather and everything too so uh every little bit counts uh i bike to work or i run to work so it's all mileage in in, in the books uh i also get up very early in the morning we're talking four four thirty uh, get on the bike, get a couple uh, training sessions in there, go outside running, and then by the time the family actually gets up, then uh, I got two trainings already uh, done. Uh, the mm -hmm. thing is, uh, you get tired very fast, so when it comes 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, I'm, 
<laughs> I'm exhausted, but it's fine. Uh, you know, I go to bed very easily uh, at night. But we're talking a good uh, 16 to 20 hours uh, per week, depending on uh, on where I'm at on the, during the schedule as well. Uh, I got to say, in my number one uh, advantage here is my, is my family. They're super supportive. They're my number one fan. Uh, without them, it, w- it wouldn't happen. Uh, and similar to my chain of command, they're really good. Uh, I- I'm lucky uh, that I'm I'm competing at a level and I'm bringing. Uh, when when you're on the podium wearing the the Canadian Armed Forces uh, kit. Uh, it makes them look good too, you know, so it's really, really good uh, uh, propaganda for them. So, uh, no, it's good. Uh, <laughs> good <publicity. laughs> and, uh, no, it's good. Uh, so they're really, really supportive, uh, providing some time off sometime during like uh, a full Ironman. Uh, sometimes I have to take annuals, but sometimes they'll provide me with the time off. Uh, mm-hmm. Normally, most comp- competitions are during the weekend. But uh, the award ceremonies and stuff are on the following Monday, and, and most of the time uh, they provide me with that time, so it's uh, really appreciated. Yeah, and also you have to travel if you do it like As somewhere well, else. Correct, yeah. So, and there's um, some people I know they did some competition in Puerto Rico, for example. So they have to be there a couple of days before just to uh, know the place, acclimatate a little bit, how it goes, and all that. So it's always good to have like free time to do that. That's pretty nice for your employers. Um, we already know since we're working in the military, me and Gian, um, but we know how supportive they are, but it's mm-hmm. always good to know that reinforcement, um, and reinforce it, maybe call it propaganda if you want to, but <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love the fact that you, you will have an employer who will, um, encourage people to be fit, to be active and to do some competition. That's really impressive. What do you think, Ian? Oh, for sure. That's amazing, really. It's a huge commitment. And without support, a person would be really pooched, for sure. But we know um, that... Oh, oh, go ahead. uh, We know also that um, doing that kind of competition, like uh, me and Gian, we want to talk about a case, a rare case that does happen. Uh, We're not going to talk about that for long, but it's kind of important to know. Um, In that kind of competition, uh, Frederick told me that he never saw that in his uh, life right now. But we, me and Gian, we do see some uh, cases like that. And the case name is rhabdomyolysis. So uh, rhabdomyolysis, Gian will explain to you uh, what it is and how can you get that and all that. And uh, we'll go from there. But yeah, it's a rare case. So don't be that afraid. But it does happen, though. So Gian, can you explain to us what is a rhabdomyolysis? Sure. So, you know, obviously there are a lot of health risks with any sport, particularly for folks who are underprepared. Um, we've talked in previous webinars or, or podcasts or whatever we're calling it these days about overuse <laughs> injuries, um, shin splints, uh, PFS, that type of thing. So rhabdomyolysis is a, um, a medical problem. It, it's not a musculoskeletal problem. Um, and it, it can be quite a serious pathology, again, that uh, people need to be aware of. And this is certainly something that working in the, the base medical clinic that we do see. It, it's not something that's like a unicorn and you just hear about it. We've definitely had folks that have presented with this. Um, so rhabdomyolysis, again, it's a hard thing to say. So we just usually call it rhabdo. Uh, It's basically a breakdown of damaged skeletal muscle. So when this muscle breaks down, there's the release of myoglobin. And what that is, is a protein that stores oxygen within the muscles. So when the myoglobin is released into the bloodstream, it can cause kidney damage or even lead to renal failure. So it can be a serious life-threatening condition. So um, rhabdo can have both traumatic and uh, non-traumatic causes. So some traumatic causes would be third degree burns, uh, crush injuries from motor vehicle accidents, that type of thing that actually crush the muscle and cause muscle damage. Uh, Venomous snake bites are another example of something that can cause traumatic rhabdo. Um, Non-traumatic examples, and what's certainly more related to our podcast today and our population, is um, extreme muscle strain so with extreme type of sports particularly in in folks who aren't aren't prepared so um, again this occurs especially in untrained athletes although elite athletes can can suffer from this as well and it can actually be more dangerous for them because there's more muscle mass to break down which means there's more myoglobin which means there's more load on their kidneys um yeah and what will be the sign and symptoms of uh of a rhabdo so it can be tricky uh, because 
is of course varies depending on the uh, cause and as well as uh, depending on the individual. Um, so symptoms may occur in one area of the body or it may be more generalized um, and it can it depends too on the stage. There's there's some um, different complications that can arise at, in earlier or late stages of the condition. So the classic rhabdo triad is muscle pain and this will often be in the shoulder, thighs or the lower back so often the larger muscle groups. Um, muscle weakness or difficulty moving that's a, a second one and also people will often see a change in the color of their urine. Um, It'll be darker, either red or brown, and uh, there'll be a decrease in, in the volume of urine. So um, there are some folks that will not have muscle-related symptoms. Um, so others, some other common signs are abdominal pain, dehydration, uh, nausea and vomiting, fever and tachycardia. So tachycardia is an increased heart rate, um, confusion and loss of con consciousness. So it, it can be very serious. Again, it's not common, but it is something that we see and it's something that does definitely need to be addressed if it arises. So um, to diagnose it, it is a medical condition. So it requires the, the diagnosis from a physician. They usually will do this via uh, urinalysis and also blood work um, just to see where everything's at that way. And the treatment will vary depending on the situation, um, but most cases are reversible, which is good news. So obviously um, in an ideal world, we want to prevent this from occurring. So Francis, can you make some recommendations in terms of prevention? Oh, yeah, for sure. But the um, first thing, like Kejian said, it's only when you're doing extreme exertion, physical activity that I can be helpful. Um, obviously, if a snake bite you, um, that's not preventable. Right? So you got to go to the hospital. And if it does happen, um, you, you, you're going to be really taken care of uh, by doctors. But the first thing is when you do physical activity, um, good example, like military cases are always common. And I don't know, like in any kind of like topics that we're going to talk or that we've been talking since the beginning, we're always uh, bringing some studies that were mentioning that the military was a common thing. Like we saw it in the military and why we see we see rhabdomyolysis in the military. It's because of untrained military. So when you join the military, um, you got to uh, take yourself uh, put yourself ready for that kind of stuff. Like the, the basic training is a basic training and we see it in the United States. They will not lower their standards. You have to get ready for the, their standards. So when you're not ready, obviously you, you're more at risk to have that kind of cases. And what is uh, really a good um, relation is uh, Frederick, who's uh, responsible for basic training. He was responsible uh, for basic training in Saint-Jean. So basically, Frédéric, um, maybe you never saw that case, as you already mentioned, but did you see, yeah. like, what would be your opinion about untrained people who get to basic training? Do you see that quite often or? Now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like we discussed earlier, uh, about uh, Call of Duty is not a representation of uh, what you're going to actually <laughs> live uh, coming through basic training. So I used to be... Uh, uh, platoon commander for uh, BMQs and uh, uh, 2IC for BMOQs. Uh, they show up to us. Uh, most of them, I got to say, they're, they're okay. Their fitness level is there pretty much uh, or where it needs to be in order for us to take it from there and get a bit better or to bring it where we need it to be. Uh, it's just a short percentage. We're talking like 15-ish percent. Uh, that, that show up to basic training and they, 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 they cannot even do one push-up. Uh, they cannot even do one sit-up. They do not know uh, how to, they are not fit at all. And uh, it's really, really challenging to, to uh, and then you have the other percentage that are very, very fit and very well prepared. So it, it's really challenging for, uh, for us to, to try to maintain that and to keep them motivated while not hurting and get getting uh, the other ones uh, injured, you know. So uh, find balance, but uh, we got to get her done, right? Oh, for sure. And that's why I just sent you guys uh, the studies that I am, that we are talking about. But uh, since we are also recording that podcast, um, I want to show it to the screen. So you guys will see that first podcast, uh, that first study that I'm, I am talking about right now. So they are talking about rhabdomyolysis and uh, uh, it happens when you do extreme physical activity. Uh, but there is also another, and that's the one with the military. Um, obviously, all the studies that we see on these websites are 
most of the time U.S. Army, um, just because they have like 10 times the numbers of Canadian military. So they do also uh, do a lot of studies on that. But we see that it does happen. It's uh, not really a common case, but it does happen. So as Frédéric mentioned, um, if you are interested to join the military, uh, just get yourself ready. Um, that's going to be the most smartest thing to do just because we need, you need to get ready for that kind of stuff. Like you're not, you're going to move, you're not going to play call of duty. You're not going to game. Uh, we don't really care if you're number one in the world in call of duty. Uh, it's the real thing. It's, you got to be ready to do the real stuff. So, um, the other recommendation that I can, uh, uh, give you guys, it would be to have smart goals. Now, smart goals is. Um, actually, I'm going to send you that uh, chart is um, an acronym. So I'm going to share that screen again. Um, an acronym is uh, what we use to kind of like help us to better understand. I didn't really, I'm, I'm just burning time right now. There you go. So um, let me go back to that screen. Sorry for that delay and share the screen. There you go. And boom. You guys are supposed to see this. Um, this is a, a, an acronym that says how you're going to smart your goals. So you can use this in kind of like everything that you do in life. Um, it's uh, smart, S-M-R-A-R-T. And it also works for French. You just have to translate this in French and it's going to work. It's the same acronym. So every time you do a goal or you want to set up a goal, you want to be um, the S, I use a specific goal. Um, I also use the subject. So if you do have a subject, so you got to know what you want to do as a goal, that's going to really help you, but it has to be measurable. So if you measure your goal, that's going to be good. So for example, if I take, uh, I want to run, that's good. That's specific. I want to run, but you don't know how to measure. Like, do you want to run three steps or you want to run a, a marathon? So you're going to have to measure, um, that thing. So if I say I want to run a marathon, that's good. So it's measurable. Now, achievable, that's your next question that you need to set up. So did you ever run a marathon before or should you start smaller? Should you start with a 5K before, a 10K? Because uh, there's also ultra marathon and that's probably not achievable according to your fitness condition. So that's why it's good to have that in your setups. Um, and that goes also for the next one, which is realistic. So is it realistic? So I want to run a marathon in uh, three weeks from now. Well, I don't think it's going to be realistic if you never did it. Maybe for Frédéric, if I ask him, do you want to run a marathon next week? He'll be like, yeah, sure. That's going to be a light warm up. But for us, um, it's not going to be the same. So that's why it depends on everybody. And timely, well, that's is... Um, you, you need to set up a time. So if you say one day, I want to lose 65 pounds. Okay. It's specific. It's measurable, maybe achievable, maybe realistic, but you don't know when, because you didn't set it up. You didn't be, you didn't set yourself. Okay. I want to try to lose uh, 10 pounds by the end of the month. So that's the way to create smart goals. So uh, doing this and everything that you do will help you to um, not Go excessive in your type of training and uh, be be careful of what you're doing right now. So that would be my recommendation. So I know it's not fitness wise or, um, um, but there is another study. I don't know if it's in the first one that I sent you, but they kind of like saying that uh, rhabdomyolysis tend to come from HIIT training, HIT, so high interval intensity training. And it's kind of getting kind of like, popular right now, but I would say it's not because you do a high intense interval intense, intensive workout that you will have rhabdomyolysis. It's just like know your limits. If uh, they're asking you to do 350 push-ups and you're not even capable of doing 10 push-ups, well, know your limit. Don't push yourself too far because it might create extreme damage into your uh, system. So that's why um, I would say Start slow and progressively increase your intensity. And the last thing is just because outside is it's the summer, um, there is a chart that we like to use to explain uh, the heat. 
So I'm pretty sure Fnatic know uh, and probably also comply to that kind of stuff. But when it's uh, really humid outside and uh, really uh, hot, uh, you want to focus on your uh, intensity or your uh, volume of, of um, uh, workout that you're going to do. So this chart is um, that kind of a chart that the base surgeon normally on every base will send to all the units. And during summer, we want to follow that. So the red zone, obviously, it's going to be dangerous and possible heat stroke. Um, so you're just increasing your chance to have that kind of problems or even other problems like a heat stroke. Uh, the orange zone, um, it's also uh, high risk. What they do in that case is it's um, when you go outside, you're just probably going to do a 15 minutes effort and uh, 45 minutes uh, into the shadow and relaxing effort and you're going to hydrate yourself a lot more uh, just to keep your body a hundred percent intact and you don't want to risk any kind of like health problems and then the yellow and the green are less likely but uh, they are there so this summer yes uh, the temperature can do um, have um, an effect on your on your body for sure so uh, that would be my recommendation about uh, preventing rhabdomyolysis. And also, if you don't know how to do workouts and progressively increase your intensity, well, you guys have PSP. So I will be using the PSP as much as possible. Ask them, like, can you can you pro like do a program for me and all that? So that would be my uh, also recommendation. Now, enough me talking. Let's. Um, Actually, no, um, I do have something else to share. I talk too much, but I'll do that quick um, just because it's going to be also relevant for my question to Fede. So there is also um, some training. You guys can see that, eh? Um, what I'm showing right now. Um, this is a biannual planning. So we do that um, with people who do have some objectives. So if you do have an objective that you want to do in six month or a year um, and this is a thing that we can follow up so basically it looks pretty much complex um, what i'm showing you guys but it can be different from each athletes um, and each trainers but the basic is to set up the goal in the year and then work towards that goal so that's what we're doing and that kind of stuff you got your calendar on the top and you have your uh, system or your um your systems in your body that you want to develop. So uh, in that case, it was cardio muscular compatibilities because the objective of that guy was to get ready for a CP close protection course. So these are the stuff that you can do. Um, now it's uh, an annual planning. Uh, Frédéric, have you ever worked with that kind of stuff? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, well, similar, something similar. Um, like we said, we uh, actually I'll uh, I'll share it. Like uh, we tried the other day. Well, let's see if I don't screw that one up. Uh, yeah, I got it right there. I think. Is it working? Uh, you got to share your screen. Oh yeah, it, it's working now. Perfect. So uh, as you can see on the on the one side there with the colors. So that that's my. Uh, uh, yearly uh, training plan so so it'll go from uh, normally uh, end of like the last week of December on this one normally it starts first uh, January or so and then it brings me up all the way to September uh, early September or mid September so that that's my typical uh, uh, season uh, and, and normally what I do is a, a bit of a reverse engineering so I take my two most important races which is the this year would have been the two full Ironmans uh, one was in Lake Placid on the 26th of July, and uh, my other one was 23rd of August, which was uh, in uh, Mont Tremblant for, for uh, the full again. Uh, and then I would do the reverse engineering with my training plan. So uh, training plan is a 16-week we uh, cycle. So I would uh, simply uh, uh, punch in the date 16, work downwards, uh, backwards in time. And then uh, I also have a uh, half Ironman training plan that I uh, trigger and that I just uh, fit in there. Uh, for my uh, half Ironmans and also uh, to, to get ready for my uh, full uh, season. And uh, simple enough, uh, as you can see on the right, there's a typical week uh, when I start there. Uh, I fit in a couple of sessions of swimming uh, in there and then uh, four sessions of, uh, of bike and uh, three of, uh, sorry, five of, uh, of running. 
uh, is as simple as just following the plan and uh, try to make it work. Um, what I actually do as well is uh, I try to fit in uh, the PSP um, uh, schedule. So if they have like, uh, for, for us, they teach uh, spinning on, on uh, I think it's uh, Mondays and Wednesdays at lunchtime. So I'll, I'll try to fit that in my schedule as well. So then I hit uh, on Mondays on, and Wednesdays, I have two bike sessions. So then I get stronger on the bike. So it's just that simple. Awesome. So what distance do you recommend for people who are interested in getting tr getting started with triathlons? So I uh, definitely do not start with an Ironman. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, we, I, only, I always see one or two and hear it and I'm like, oh my gosh. But um, uh, start with a sprint. Sprint is an awesome distance. There's even uh, less than that if you're not comfortable. Uh, but but uh, sprint is a really, really good distance. Uh, it's anywhere between like an hour to uh, you can take up to two hours. It's fine, you know, uh, depending on, on your speed. But uh, definitely start with a, a sprint. It's a 750 meter uh, swim in the water. Normally it's an open water. So do go out and swim in open water. Don't just go in the pool and then show up for your triathlon. Uh, Sprint and Olympic distance, you get uh, it gets pretty wavy at the start, so uh, it's really comp competitive. Uh, you get elbows and kicked in the face and stuff, so you really gotta position yourself uh, not in the straightest line, but uh, maybe go around if you're not comfortable in the water. So get just uh, go go swimming in the open water and get some friends to to pull your leg and stuff, because uh, it will happen during competitions for shorter distance, uh, long distance half <laughs> Ironman and full Ironman. People are it's long days. Uh, people are more. Um, uh, it's not 10 seconds that's going to make you win or lose a race normally uh, compared to sprints. Uh, it can be, right? So people are, uh, I want to say it, uh, I don't want to say it that way, but I will. Uh, they're more respectful to one another. They're more respectful uh, uh, on the course, uh, definitely, uh, de compared to sprint and Olympic distance. Um, but yeah, de definitely start with, with a sprint. Once you're done, uh, it'll actually get you to practice your transitions as well. Uh, between the, the swim and the, and the bike and then between the bike and the run and then after uh, if, if you really liked it and you think you can do double that then go go Olympic the next year or later during the, the, that same year and then if you still want more then go half distance uh, there, there's actually quite a few half Ironmans uh, uh, distance uh, in Canada there's uh, Mont Tremblant again there's uh, some in Calgary, uh, Victoria, uh, um, even uh, around Borden, there's Muskoka. There's quite a few out there. Uh, there's also a different brand, uh, the Barrelman in Niagara Falls. Uh, there, there's quite a few uh, uh, in Canada spread out for half Ironman. So, uh, and then if you still want some more, then uh, go for the full, for the real deal. And uh, how long do you think it takes to get to that full, to that full Ironman? Like, since you, I know, like, you started with not even knowing how to change your speed in, on your bikes. So, how long? So, so my first Ironman uh, was in 2016, so uh, two years later. Um, funny story, uh, my friend uh, Pat that challenged me to, uh, to a triathlon, um, he signed up for the half Ironman in Mont Tremblant. Uh, that one signs out normally so sells out uh, within a few hours. That same day that it opens, uh, it's like uh, super popular uh, concert tickets. They so so sell out right away, uh, but full don't sell out. So uh, not as many people uh, are committed to to that distance. So long story short, he signed up for the half and. Uh, was rubbing it a bit in my face to make me jealous that I was. And uh, and I'm like, you know what? Screw this, I'm doing the full. So I registered for the full. I remember uh, my hand was shaking when I clicked uh, to register for that one. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I was very nervous. Well, it must be. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Um, Francis had mentioned, Frederick, that you're a vegan. Um, can you tell us what dietary changes you needed to make to ensure that you're getting all the necessary nutrients? And also, how much energy does it take to complete an Ironman? So, um, I'll, I'll say uh, flex vegan, because uh, uh, when when I'm uh, competing or uh, in season, so between January and uh, and uh, September, I'm, uh, I try to be 100% vegan. Uh, but I'm not one of those vegan that uh, I'll, I'll go uh, if you have me uh, for dinner at your place and you serve steak. Well, you know what? I'll have the steak. You know, I'm not uh, I'm not religiously uh, vegan, but um, 
if you have all kinds of other options, then uh, obviously I just won't grab the steak and eat everything else. Uh, so uh, it, it, my recommendation to start with is if you want to try and go down that road, small changes. Do not flip 100% vegan red. You will discourage it. You know, you just need to do small changes, one baby step at a time. So for us, um, in 2017, uh, we did the Ironman uh, training camp in Mont-Tremblant. So for a week long, uh, we were um, uh, training a bunch of military people together and we had one vegan athlete. And uh, as you cook meal, yeah, there's always extra food and stuff for that one person. So uh, I, I ate vegan with him pretty much all week long and uh, performed extremely well during that week. I was uh, surprised the amount of uh, energy I had during, but also during the recovery. The recovery was easier. I found I had a lot of energy that night instead of being uh, exhausted. And uh, I didn't really notice until I actually came back home and started eating uh, uh, animal products again. So uh, that's when it hit me. Uh, it was, it was uh, very obvious uh, when I came back home and started eating uh, animal products again. Uh, I felt extremely heavy and it was really, really hard for me to carry on. So uh, I simply asked my wife, I said, hey, you want to try to make a change? So we started with one meal uh, per week and then the one became two and then two became four and then four became seven. So it was as uh, simple as that. Um, we do occasionally uh, eat uh, fish, but uh, very rarely. Uh, my wife uh, will eat more meat than I will, uh, but uh, for, for me, I just, uh, I, I don't need it. There's, uh, you get the proteins everywhere else. There's tons, tons of protein. There's so much options out there. There's supplements. Uh, for me, I'm, uh, I have, I'm ambassador for F2C Nutrition. They, they provide me with all kinds of uh, supplements that, that, that uh, that, that do more than, than provide me more than enough uh, of what I need. Their protein, uh, uh, vegan protein is amazing. Uh, I also take uh, just vitamin uh, B uh, to, to supplement uh, and also vitamin D because uh, there's never enough in Canada. Uh, but that's it. That's all I take. Uh, so that's kind I, of cool to see that yeah. the whole family is following your diet also. But um, how's your teenager reacting on that? My daughter, uh, she's 13. A funny thing, she never ate meat. Uh, even as a baby, she would not. She, uh, in her plate, the, the meat was, was always there. She, she'll like pick away at it just because uh, we kind of force it on her a bit. And, uh, but uh, she does not eat meat. Uh, she, she, she'll eat fish, but that's about it. Yeah, she's a pasta girl. And, uh, yeah. So compliant to your diet. That's pretty nice. Yeah, uh, very lucky. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> And uh, you mentioned how many uh, calories, uh, mm -hmm. how many energy you need. Well, uh, I burn uh, normally between 10 to 12,000 uh, calories during an Ironman. Mm -hmm. So obviously it'll vary between uh, the uh, conditions because uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's re relative to the heart rate and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, anywhere is between 10 to 12,000 calories. So how do you, um, this is like really interesting because you're gonna burn 10 to 12,000. We don't even eat that per day here. But how, like, you obviously need to eat during a competition. And, like, mm -hmm. being a vegan during a competition, do you have, like, special products or, uh, like, what do you, how do you eat during so, competitions? Uh, so the, the, so the uh, F2C Nutrition, uh, my, the, one, uh, the company I'm uh, an ambassador for, they're, uh, they're actually, um, they're vegan, they have vegan pro products that are amazing. They, uh, there's something called glycodurance, which is like a, a, some sort of a starch that uh, provides you long lasting energy. Uh, this stuff works. Uh, they're a Canadian company out of BC. They're amazing. Uh, they, they, their products is amazing uh, and works for me as well. Uh, also, I, I also uh, need to eat solid too, a, a little bit on that. So like uh, I'll grab a granola bar and stuff and uh, whatever's available on the course, they have uh, um, water and uh, uh, electrolyte uh, products and stuff on, on the course as well. So uh, I'll, I'll just grab whatever the, there's there as well. But I, with, uh, with my uh, company, I can make a super bottle that lasts me for like 1500 calories easy. So you just put a couple of those on your bike and you got 3000 calories right there. Uh, but what's key is the pre-race nutrition as well. That's uh, really, really huge. So uh, we'll eat uh, tons, tons, tons of pasta uh, the, the, the two days before and uh, just uh, uh, bank the energy as much as you can and then uh, sur survive the race. 
Yeah, they call that carb loading. So you right. uh, you guys do a lot of carb loadings before a competition. Oh, yeah. yeah, you need that you need that calorie. Yeah. But like um, with the equipment, like I know I know how much that bike behind you costs. But if somebody wants to start in that field, uh, can you give us like like how how expensive? Give us the numbers. Like we need to know the numbers here. <laughs> so uh, if you're going to invest in anything and you don't have much money, uh, I'll, I'll tell you right now, just invest in a good pair of running shoes. So don't go to sports check, go to a running uh, store uh, where they can actually see you run with their shoes in uh, on, on you. And uh, they can actually evaluate if you're pronate or if you're neutral or whatever, and they'll sell you the right shoe for you not to get injured uh, a good pair of shoes you're talking in average about two hundred dollars so uh if you're going to start somewhere start there uh that for the swim you just need to, to to not sink you know for the bike you'll get there eventually the fact that you have a mountain bike or that you have a, a killer bike like this in the back you'll just be a bit slower but you won't injure yourself so that's why i'm going to say if you're going to start anywhere start with the running shoes um and small changes. Uh, don't don't try to buy everything at once. It's way too expensive. And buy used. Uh, I started with a aluminum uh, uh, road bike. Uh, signed out from the gym at BSP and Borden. Depending where you're at. Um, uh, for us in Saint Jean, there is a couple of bikes as well that are available for people that would like to sign them out. Uh, ask a friend uh, to, to 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 borrow their uh, road bike or something like that. Um, you don't need to buy everything all at once. I mean, there's no replacement for displacement. So the legs, uh, the, the, the engine is, uh, plays a big part in there. I remember with my uh, shitty old uh, uh, aluminum bike uh, passing people that had $10,000 plus dollar bike and rigs and I would pass them like they were stopped. You know, like uh, if you're well trained for this, uh, there's no need for you to spend 10000 on a bike. Uh, of course, uh, as you get uh, into into it more, uh, for me, it's uh, it, triathlon's a lifestyle for me now. Uh, it, uh, my whole life revolves around that, you know. So that's why I'm investing in this kind of business. And uh, oh, yeah, a wetsuit, sure. like I mentioned, was uh, six. Uh, they're, they're they're running around eight hundred bucks now. Uh, you're talking for a wetsuit, uh, so so it, it gets expensive really fast. Like uh, just registering for a full Ironman, you're talking over a thousand dollars. So uh, start start small. Start small. Oh. Uh, local races. There's tons of local races, uh, local triathlons in, in the communities. You just gotta search for them. Uh, I know Wainwright can be a bit uh, trickier. I don't know if there's any lake there even. <laughs> yeah, there, there, yeah, there, there, yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, we have Arm Lake and Clear Lake. Okay, and these are swimming cool. them. Oh yeah, I scuba dive in Clear Lake, actually. Okay, so. Cool. Uh, yeah, you can swim on uh, on these lakes for sure. There's only two minutes left, but I know that one person asked a question, so I would like to uh, for you to answer because I think it's uh, directly to you. Uh, it's okay. uh, do you have a time limit uh, to do these kind of competitions? So uh, funny story, yes. Uh, so uh, you have seven for full Ironman. You'll have 17 hours. So uh, uh, you'll start at seven in the morning, and you'll have until midnight, and uh, it's quite the show. Uh, for me, I um, when I'm done my race last year, I'm always done around the, the just uh, sub ten hours uh, or, or around that time normally, and uh, I have time to bring my bike to my car and uh, take it apart, clean it up, and uh, have a shower, get changed and stuff, and and eat and recover, and then I, I come to the finish line and people are still finishing and it's midnight and uh, we cheer them on and and uh, if you're not crossing that line at seventeen after seventeen hours, you're you don't get the medal, you know, you, you're not an Ironman, unfortunately, and you'll just have to try next year or another event. But uh, 17 hours is for uh, for the Ironman, yes. Wow. So you do have 17 hours. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, so um, for all of you guys, like, if you do have some questions, feel free to send it up, send it to us, uh, even Frederick. Um, and they will answer your question, like, with... Uh, as much as happiness like actually we only have an hour and we can go on and on and on like never stopping because it's a passion like it's a passion that you can even see in Frederick he does have that passion in him and uh, we we kind of like enjoy his time with us today so I would like to thank you Frederick to be uh, with us you're in Quebec right now so you're kind of like two hours ahead so it's six o'clock over at your place right now and you did gave us a, a lot of time to just talk about 
Iron Man. So I hope you guys uh, were intrigued about that uh, podcast and also that you know more about this kind of uh, competitions. And um, we'll see if uh, you guys would like to know more about it. Just let us know. Um, and uh, we will reinvite that uh, that Frederick guy uh, on this podcast with, with pleasure. So uh, thank you, Gian. As usual, you're always thank with you. us. And thank you, Frederick. Um, I hope to see you guys thank you very soon. Much. Thanks. Yeah, and I hope to see you guys soon. And next week, we're going to talk about pregnancy. So uh, I hope you guys are going to be there next week. All right. So see you guys next time. See you later. Have a good night. Bye.